Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's product school talk. Um, as you guys know, we teach product management, coding, data, and now blockchain at our 14 campuses around the world. Uh, today, we have a very special guest with us. We have uh, Guy Asadu from um, PlayStation. Hi, Guy. How are you doing today? Hey, Xander. How's it going? Great. Um, happy to have Hi, you everyone. here. <laughs> yeah, very excited. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's um, Before we talk. begin, um, if you know could you um, take a minute and tell everyone a little bit more about your background and how you broke into product management. Oh, sure. So I'm coming from an undergrad of uh, engineering background. So I worked as an engineer, electrical engineering with minor in computer sciences. So I did hardware, I did software before that. Uh, but as I was progressing more in my career and exposing more, you know, in, in larger organizations, I felt that, uh, you know, a lot of the decisions that are guiding the engineers are made on the business side. And so I really wanted to kind of expose myself more to that. And then I came to the States. I did my undergrad, uh, sorry, my MBA at College of Northwestern and rounded my skill set and then dived into the role of a product manager at the Sony PlayStation. That was my first real uh, role there. And so uh, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Okay, awesome. Um, well, I know you have a presentation uh, put together for everyone, so I'll give you a couple seconds to start screen sharing and get that prepared. And, um, and everyone, while he's getting that ready, just know that whenever his presentation is over, uh, we'll go ahead and take some questions from the audience. So. All right, let me know. And um, yeah, it looks good. So you can take it from here. All right, great. So first of all, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, you know, when I was asked to kind of talk about a subject, I was really thinking about what, where can I add value? And, you know, I think when I read a lot about the articles and information out there in the community, it really has an underlying assumption of, um, you know, that all the boundaries are well, very well established between the different functions in our organization and everyone knows exactly what to do. However, that underlying assumption is not true in scaling organizations or teams that didn't have previous product management in place. So from, you know, today I'm gonna to share with you guys my experience and my take on the role of the, what I call the first product manager that comes into an organization that's scaling or that is joining a team that never had product management in place. So, uh, and before I jump into, I'm sorry, just a sec, what's going on? <clears throat> All right, so before uh, we start and dive into that, I think it's important that uh, we'll have some definition in place. And I think I wanna start with my take on a product management role. And um, you know, the, the best way to explain stuff is using analogies. So I'm gonna use my, the, the analogy that, I, that resonated the most with me, I guess. And um, when you think about Product management, there's all kinds of analogies out there in the marketplace. The biggest one is the, the mini CEO. There's also the intrapreneur analogy. Um, so first of all, you know, product management is not, they're not CEOs. They should think like a CEO, but they should not behave like a CEO. They don't have the authority. We'll talk about it in a sec. Uh, but, you know, the best analogy I could come up with is the quarterback analogy. And this was before the Super Bowl. This I used this image. Probably I need to change it now, but... Um, and I'll explain why this analogy resonates so much, so well with me. So the first thing we talked about, right, um, product management doesn't usually have formal authority. We, we operate a lot by influence. And the latest research I've seen, over 65% don't have any hiring, uh, don't make any hiring decisions, nor they have uh, direct reports. So usually we operate uh, with no authority. So, and the, the analogy to that is that we don't decide who's the players on the team. We don't decide which, which players we're bringing onto the team and we're hiring. Right? We, we are giving a team and we say, this is what you get to win with. The second thing is product management is really uh, a part of the team and is in the action, right? Like a quarterback, he's taking the hits, he's sweating with the team on the field, and he's not uh, kind of this part that's removed from that. And I think it very, very much aligns with how product management works. Similarly, you know, quarterback calls the game plan and strategy the same thing. Product management is using the roadmap and the feature prioritization, and we kind of call the game plan in that sense. 
Uh, we are expected to continuously adapt to the opponent, the playing field, and the conditions. It's very much like the quarterback in our world, right? The opponent is the competitors, playing field is the market, and conditions are regulations. And to account all of those every time we make a decision. And last but not least, I think that, you know, one of the main roles of product management is to motivate others. Think about a quarterback, and if it's if it, they're down 10, two touchdowns in, in uh, the first half, he comes in and is expected to talk up and pep up the team and give them motivated and, and have them, uh, 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 you know, come up on the field in the second half and kind of uh, win, right? The same thing with product management. I think when we're talking about the development team, it's about helping motivate them, keep them understanding why it's important, uh, what they're doing. Uh, and so if you look at those points, I think it's really a great analogy. Now, uh, a more uh, established or a formal definition is actually, I, I kind of, this one resonates with me as well, is by Don Venedetti, he's a 30 years a veteran in the community and a thought leader. And I'll explain you in a quick, you know, uh, why why I like this definition. So, you know, it's to deliver, the, the role of the product manager is to deliver measurable business results through product solutions that meet both the market needs and company goals. And I think, you know, I highlighted a few points here. First is the deliver. Product management is a lot about taking a concept and bringing it to market. It's not just doing the analysis. It's not just coming up with design. It's actually help deliver that and have it in the, the customer's hands. The second part is the business result. I think product management, if you're not thinking about how your product adds value and allows the business to capture value in the marketplace and how does your product impact business metrics, then I would argue you might not doing your job very well. Uh, and then, you know, the market needs and company goals. Market needs, obviously, is the customer. We're very focused about the customer needs, the pain points, and opportunities to delight, and that's what it means. And company goals, again, you got to align the product with the, the company positioning, with the company goals, and the vision, right? And so I think one of the questions that's really asked a lot is, you know, I'm saying deliver. And on the other hand, I'm saying uh you don't have any formal authority, so how do you deliver, right? And I think when you think about it, the answer is really the core product team. And when I say core product team, I mean the, the UX, the engineering team, and product management working in concert to deliver to market. So, and, you know, this is kind of my view on uh, in high level on the role of a product management. Now I want to kind of take the conversation and use this baseline in talking about the role of product management in scaling organization. So, but let's first talk about, you know, how does uh, uh, the product team evolves in a, in a scaling organization? And it's funny, you know, it's a funny image, but it's kind of true. First of all, there's the founder who thinks about an idea and he brings some engineers, right? They're the first people probably to be there and they're building the product and they're reaching scale and they realize at some point, oh, you, you know what? We're probably, we need some help on the design, make it look better, better interactions. So they... They kind of bring design into the fold. And then lastly, when scale um, and speed reach to a, a critical point that the core team can't handle on, anymore on their own, they bring product management, right? And this is not to, I think this is the reality of the world, right? They're not focused about building the thing, but focused about building the company, prove mark product, market fit. Uh, and so, you know, this is the reality. So it's not discounting anyone, uh, but this is kind of how it's built. Now, when product management is brought into place, now there's a need to rethink this structure, right? Uh, and there's the current state we're talking about. And aside from, I think, you know, part of the goals of product management when coming to a new organization that's scaling is not only to do the product management job, but it's also to taking this, you know, the team that is currently structured this way and take it to a new state where it's kind of this, you know, high efficient, very well adapted machine that can literally move mountains, right? And that's kind of one of the, the main goals. Uh, and in addition to the standard definition of the role is to take the organization and the product team from the current state and take it into the new state. Um, and one thing you can probably, people can argue is like, oh uh, yeah, but you know, they're probably working well together. And I think that assumption is not a safe assumption. And I can tell you from my own experience that I've seen, uh, I was on teams that uh, I joined a team that UX and design and engineering were sitting on the same floor, but wouldn't talk to each other, right? <laughs> so 
those are scenarios that are happening in the market and they might not even work as efficient as it should have. So we want to have this change process from the current state to the new state, right? And I think it's important to understand the change process. It's important to understand that's the scenario you're coming into and what to expect, right? And I also highlight a few points of what you can do about it. Uh, but, you know, I took this framework. Um, there's a model that's on a change model that uh, was established, you know, created by Kurt Lowens in the 60s, and it's a force field change model, it's called, right? And when you, any change you're trying, any time you're trying to make a change, there is, uh, there are forces that are acting against the status quo, and there are forces that are acting to keep the status quo in place. And that's why it's called force field. So I kind of took that framework and I adapted that uh, based on uh, on my experience and created this, you know, this this uh, graph to kind of illustrate the journey that you, one can expect and what do you need to do about it. So uh, first thing it's, uh, it's that you can notice this is a, a, a long process. It's not immediate. Uh, and it has three main uh, distinct steps. Right, and there, and we'll talk about it. There's the assess, the unfreeze, and the change. The assess. You're a new product manager. You came into the organization. You don't want to act like an elephant in a china store, right? You want to settle in, feel the vibe, understand, and you want to assess and on almost every aspect of the organization. Anything from obviously the business strategy. How is it we're going to win? Do your market analysis. Assess the culture. Both. Uh, assess the hierarchy structure, both formal and informal hierarchy structures, um, because sometimes not the the the, the person with the uh, biggest title is uh, has the biggest influence. So you want to understand that as well. You want to have some appreciation to how the product got to where it is. Obviously, you probably have a lot of ideas and notions about what could be done better, but you got to have some appreciation to how it got to the place it was and why they made the, the decisions and trade-offs. And uh, and not uh, discounted the work, right? They, they brought it in the, the organization scaling, so they did something right. Um, and you want to obviously assess the development process. Uh, is it is it predictable? Is it the features are written well? Uh, is there a QA in place? Uh, and and all all kinds of those things. So you assess, you understand where you're at. The second, and this is probably between a month and two months, and you also want to interview almost everyone in the organization and get the different point of views. The unfreeze part of that change process is where you are preparing the organization to accept the changes necessary. And you're also uh, involving uh, the different stakeholders in kind of starting to formulate what that change would be. And it's very important at that point of time to really focus on one or two main things that you think are needed to change so the organization um, and that has two things a if you try to change too much you're going to fail and b you want to be able to really focus your message and create a system of urgency and it's hard to harder to do if you're trying to do and if you're trying to communicate too many things so you have to be you know use your product skills and prioritize um, so you're you're you know this is down freeze you're creating the system of urgency you're formulated the idea and now you're starting to enact the change it's important to understand that um, you know now it's about actually starting to modify team behavior and team members' behavior to fit kind of this new vision of how the team should work together. And it's really important to understand this is not a linear. You know, you start at one point and it goes all the way up all across time, right? It, this is actually uh, you're expected to have setbacks. We'll talk about it in a sec and what you can do about it. Uh, you expect that the performance might get hindered for a while until people get accustomed to the new way of, of doing things, and then you, got, you will start seeing the results. In my experience, this is usually going to take about nine months before you're like, oh, this is actually working, so cool. Um, and that's why you're seeing the nine kind of start over there. So this is kind of the journey you can one can expect when undertaking and coming into the product role in a new in an organization that's scaling. And I think one more thing uh, to explain, it's important, you know, we're product managers, we want to use the skill sets we have. So it's understand it's important to be empathetic to what people in the organization feel, not just to your customers. And I think the Lego analogy is a really great analogy, by the way, on that. Um, 
And this was given by, you know, Molly Graham. She was a former Facebook and Google employee. And she kind of came up with this analogy that I think it's really strong. So think about it like, you know, it's a scaling team. And think about there's all kinds of uh, tons and tons of Lego pieces scattered. And everyone's trying to build this complex tower, right? And everyone can play with all of the pieces, right? And now a product manager comes in and there is no vacuum. Someone someone or multiple people are making those product decisions. And now you're starting to take Lego pieces that they feel they, they own. And they're starting to ask yourself them, themselves, even if not consciously, um, wait a second, wait, wait, is this not my job to play with this Lego piece? This is my Lego piece. And wait a second, what if he does this better than me, right? And, and you know, those are strong emotions that you have to account for. And those emotions now create a distribution in personas in the organization. So let's understand personas, right? Again, product management, same principles that you use to build products are important here when you do this change process. And usually when, you know, this is a normal distribution curve that um, here it's not different. And there are three types of personas when you're going through a change process like this. The first one are, is the blocker. The blockers are people that will oppose any and all change and they will not want to change the status quo. The big majority would be bystanders. They they go with the flow. They want to fly under the radar. They're not sure how this is going to turn out, so they don't want to pick sides, and they're just going to wait to see what's going on happen. And then you got the champions, right? And it's important to understand you have supporters, the people that want to have this change. You understand the importance of the change. So you want to understand, you know, when you're coming in, you want to kind of map out the landscape and understand who are those personas, and then. Uh, start recruiting the champions to help you evangelize this within the organization and create this social pressure. Now, you know, the blockers, how do you deal with the blockers? And this is a really great question. And, and I'm going to give you just, I'm going to give you guys just a couple of thinking points. The first one is, and I'm, I'm really trying to emphasize the product skill set that are meaningful here. You know, one of the things that's important for a product manager to do is be able to seek, listen, and incorporate feedback into the product from the market, from customers, right? And the same thing you want to do here. You want to actively list, seek, listen, and incorporate feedback from those blockers, that those people that don't want to have this change in place. And you want to have those uncomfortable conversations with them. And I can tell you from my experience that I was sitting in those types of conversations and people were staring at me like with an evil eye, right? And, and over time, as you have more of those conversations, they really acknowledge that you're not against them, but about it's about the product and the company, they really start to open up. But the key point here is to be vulnerable. Don't think you have all the answers and be humble. The second thing is you want to have a FaceTime. You know, I, I, we're product managers we're working in digital space. We're, uh, we're expected to be innovators and in, in leverage the latest technologies, but you're dealing with people. And the frequency of interaction and the face-to-face -face time is invaluable and irreplaceable. So you, if, if your team is not co-located, you want to fly out there to them. And if you can't fly out, you want to use Skype or Hangout, any other way that you can see their face and they can see your face. It's really important. Um, one major thing is that a lot of the times you will face disagreements, especially from blockers don't want to change, uh, and friction. And if you're in the team settings, that could really poison your team. So so don't take the bait. Don't start the, the argument there. Don't try and prove them wrong right then and there. Uh, take the discussion offline. Say, all right, I, I get your point. I would love to talk about it. Can we do this uh, offline after this meeting, right? If you get into those disagreements again and again, it will poison your team. It will hurt morale and it will hurt the change process. Um, one last one before last on on the kind of ideas on how to deal with obstacles so eventually you know you're going to do a lot of wars to try and get the blockers to be bystanders and, and even champions but sometimes a blocker would be would be a blocker right so at that point of time you want to try and isolate blockers and when i say isolate it means that you don't give them the room you know, if, he, if, if you know someone is a blocker and he's throwing out like those sarcastic comments throughout discussions, just, just ignore it. Like acknowledge it, mm -hmm, all right, and move on. Don't dwell on that. 
And last point of advice I'm going to give you guys is do an actual exercise of defining roles and responsibilities. And there's a great exercise that's called RACI, where it's basically you're listing all, you're sitting with all those people that uh, feel that you're taking their Lego blocks. And, I, and the goal is to say, and trying to kind of, there's always going to be overlap, but it's trying to kind of make sure that people know where the Lego blocks are uh, so that uh, you'll have room to operate in and they don't feel that strong emotion that you're taking their job or you're stepping on their toes. And the race exercise is basically listing all those different activities that are, that uh, uh, you're, you know, both of the, the stakeholders are undertaking and trying to come up with a decision of who's the, who's the accountable that's the A, by the way. Accountable is who's the person that has the final vote or final say on that decision. And then, you know, is, he says it online if this doesn't go well. Responsible who's doing the work. Uh, consult that is who's person you're bringing into the conversation to get his thoughts on, but not necessarily uh, you have to uh, uh, get his agreement to, to that. And inform is the people you just let know that this was the decision that was made. And so you try and break that, uh, the, the roles uh, and responsibilities based on those criteria. And just going through the exercise, even without getting to a final conclusion, helps kind of bring into, you know, uh, into the conscience their, their actions. And people just with that would start to, to kind of reevaluate their position. It was really helpful. Go and learn more about that exercise. The last thing I want to talk about, and I know we're, uh, almost on time, I want to leave you guys time for questions, is, so, is a small thing that's really impactful and really meaningful into the change process. This is what I call celebrate quick wins. So people are looking to see that the change is working in the right place, those bystanders, right? And they are looking for signals that is going the way it should be. So celebrating quick wins gives the signal to the organization and, to the, and the people within it, that this is going in the right direction. And this creates a, a virtual cycle as more people become more champions. And then there's more social pressure which, uh, uh, to be more supportive of the change and gives less room for blockers to really have uh, you know, impact on the change process. So I'm going to give you three quick, one, uh, quick wins. Data, right? Product management is expected to use data and use it. Start me collecting metrics, start measuring stuff, and report on metrics that are changing in the right direction. Just anything that can give indication that you're moving in the right direction is great. Do that, do that often. Provide context, lots of context, you know, give the business updates, bring the outside world into the organization, bring it into the development team. Tell them about those stories. And know that customers, a lot of times, uh, there's not enough attention. Of course, you know, they're building a product, but since they're building, there's all kinds of things that are happening uh, uh, sometimes the, the customer point of view is a bit forgotten. So you want to bring that, you know, any conversation you had, any anecdotal information you brought, Hey, I was on this conversation and they really love this new feature that we deployed, right? Uh, give the interview summaries, really powerful stuff that will help you kind of move the needle and, and get you to a better place. And that's kind of, uh, my take on things. I know it was a quick one, but, uh, um, Happy to open the floor to questions. Awesome. Thanks, Guy, for a great presentation. We already have a few questions that came through on Facebook. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the first one out for you. Uh, this is coming from Gabriel. Um, I'm a product designer, and I'm learning how to better relationships with my PMs. What advice can you give on building a better relationship with designers and product managers? Oh, that's a great question. A great question, and, and I think the the you know the partnership between product and design and UX is really critical, right? And what I would say is that I think that um, UX the the way you frame things, right? I think that product management, uh, in my view, they they have a overall responsibility of the success of the product, right? Obviously, it's shared with engineering and 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 design, but they really care about how this is gonna help move the needle, how this is going to align overall. So anytime you come up with a suggestion, try and back it up with data. We really are inclined to use data and it's better argument than, you know, I just like this design better, uh, right? Bring that to the table, the data points, why this would be helpful and how you can help validate uh, that this is, was the right decision. 
And I think that this will help you build trust with product management. I think I explain how this aligns with the overall vision for the product. And, you know, sometimes it's very cool to do something, but it doesn't really align with the other parts of the, the product and it kind of breaks that overall user experience. So try to make sure that the suggestion you're making and the explanation you're providing to why you're doing that really aligns with the overall vision that product management is outlining for the product and the feature. Awesome, um, thank you. And our, our next question is from, let's see, um, from Jeremy. Um, a lot of product managers have come from different backgrounds and have wound up in the role. Um, now that the position is becoming more defined, what would you say is the best way to become one? And is there a specific route to take? I think that, you know, uh, any data that you look at, product management is coming from all walks of life in a sense. Uh, so, but I would say that I think there's a lot of emphasis in product now and it's critical to your ability to do the job is on data. So I think if you can emphasize two things in how your previous roles align with both building empathy, you know, understanding the customer pain point, you know, if you're coming for customer success, that's great. You have that. Um, if you're coming for marketing, you know, you're supposed to understand the market very well. So you bring that to the table. And then really emphasize your analytic skill. And if you don't have one, build that skill set. You know, how to look at data, how to interpret data, how to think about metrics when you're doing that. And if you can do that with adequate level of being able to discuss with engineering so that they can understand you and that they, you know, they, you can push back on some of the things they're telling you, that should be a great place to start as a product manager and be a successful product manager. Uh, not necessarily only from technology, though I would say that, you know, there is an advantage to that. But it's not a must-have. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So um, our next one is from Trevor. Um, can you provide any insights on how to align with account managers and understand the role responsibilities between the two? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I'll give you my take on the account manager role. So think about it like if I'm an account manager, what do I care? I care about the success of my accounts and so that can expand um, and have them stay with us longer times, right? And so one of the things that happens a lot of times and I feel it on a daily basis is that they have very specific features and needs that they're trying to, you know, to have implemented in the product so that they're accounts would be more successful. And I think that's where they're, they have a very good input into the process of prioritization. However, they have to acknowledge that, I think this is where I draw the line, they have to acknowledge that a single account or a feature that benefits a single account either doesn't work for the general customer base or doesn't align with where we wanna take the product and win in the marketplace as a whole, right? And I think that's where they, you have to be, the product management needs to do a good job of explaining those aspects of the, of the product and, and, and the decisions they're making. But I would expect that they understand that they have valuable input into the process, but they're not, have the, you know, they're not doing the prioritization and they're not doing the feature definition. And that's where I would uh, advocate to kind of draw the line between the two. Awesome. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, and that's all the time we have for today. So before we go, um, I know we have quite a few questions um, that came in after two. Um, we'll try to get on uh, the comment section and, and get some responses to those as well after. Um, but before we go, uh, can you share your advice for aspiring product managers? Yes, you know, I, I think like the way I answered the, the question before, you got to have the analytics skill set. It's a must have in today's marketplace. And it's a, and when you think about the informal aspect of the authority of the role, data is really a great point for you to help uh, influence the decision making in organizations and the more data oriented, by the way, not data for the sake of data, right? It's data for the sake of better user experience, data for the, for the sake of better uh, delivery of business results and products into the market you know, you got to build that skill set. And I think if you don't have that mindset, that's where you got to strengthen your, your, your skill set to be an aspiring product manager. 
Awesome. Thank you so much again. Appreciate you joining us today and taking the time to get to a few questions. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. It was great uh, being here and sharing some of my thoughts with you guys. Awesome. Um, well, and thanks again, everyone, of course, for being here. Um, if you want more information about us, you can find that at productschool.com, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.